Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Shreshta Shamsundar. I'm a distinguished technologist at Infosys. And over the next 20 to 25 minutes, I will be covering uh, how API strategy uh, is getting influenced or will be influenced uh, in a big way in the era of generative AI to continue to remain relevant for all of our industries. So um, if you go further, how I've structured um, this session is I'll first start off with the state of AI uh, in terms of what it means for enterprises and then give you a bit of how AI is sort of invading all our spaces and disrupting our day to day and then navigate into API strategy and then some of the key trends that would come in as a result of corporates, including AI as part of their corporate strategy and the implications for us in the API engineering field. So in terms of the state of AI, um, roughly from the year, if I were to roll back, say, 15 years or so, we were that was right about the time when AWS started in 2006. And GCP followed suit uh, in 2008 and Azure in 2010. And right about the time of 2007 was the iPhone launch. So in terms of key events between uh, 2006 and 10, um were some of these events and if you look at um the iphone launch that led to an explosion in terms of people uh, necessarily consuming content uh, both digitally as well as on their mobile service and some of these trends um initially took a bit of time because there were so folks were pretty hesitant in terms of sharing some of their uh, information online and being able to utilize some of these services on their phone was uh, was somewhat of a new experience, but uh, uh, people got over it. And then there was this big boom um, that resulted and which is what we are seeing even today. And this sort of began to plateau around 2015. On the cloud side, although these services were there between 26 and 2010, it was only after 2011 on the back of the global financial crisis um, and the, in that during that recovery time period, what happened was there was this um, uh, organizations were cash crunched and therefore they were looking for cost effective IT solutions uh, around about that time. And uh, cloud solutions initially AWS and uh, very soon Azure and GCP caught up and we rode the cloud wave from 2012 and it's sort of moving exponentially high even to this day. Even for the cloud, uh, there was a sort of a, an element of hesitation that um, customers were facing in terms of putting up some of their prized data elements onto a public cloud that was internet facing, regardless of the security elements that uh, cloud providers and other hyperscalers in general offered, uh, it did uh, cause a bit of hesitation in the eyes of the public mind. And so similarly, what we're seeing now is an AI era. And um, during this entire time frame that there was this mobile and digital and cloud explosion, consumerization of AI is also underway. And the, the companies who've done the digital and cloud transformation well will necessarily be able to take advantage of the AI era much better than the others. And if you look at our timeline view, between 2012 and 2017, uh, large um, uh, cloud companies uh, were investing in AI Google particularly ha were, came out with their transformer architecture around 2017, and that yielded a lot of interest in natural language processing and conversational AI. That sort of started off in that manner. And around about 2020, um, in, ex in addition to national language, natural language processing, um, companies were looking at using the same transformer architecture for text and video and image processing as well. And given that it was so reusable in that context, when chat GPT, the similar to the iPhone trend, came out in 2022, that resulted in mass consumerization of AI. People began to see value in utilizing AI for both their personal, as well as it became the talk of the town in terms of what it could do that even search engines couldn't often get right. So we are now in that AI world. And if you look at the last seven months, 130 plus large language models have made their way in. Um, models have not just gotten proliferated, they are becoming hugely sophisticated. They're able to understand a lot more information than they used to even seven or eight months ago. We started off seeing models that could support 1.5 billion parameters and now we are already up to half a trillion 
and some models that are being discussed today are over 1 trillion parameters. Therefore, they're able to process in parallel a lot more information than it could be before. And the rate at which people are consumerizing AI is about building products and sophisticated products at that are coming out at rapid speed, where specialized products that is already in mass consumption have been over 35 in just the last seven months on some of these large language models that didn't make their appearance at all in, uh, uh, you know, since then. So there has been a huge amount of interest in this field. Now, while is it, is it all hype? Uh, is there further meaning to it? Let's take a deep dive. Now, when you look at AI adoption, we see five major trends in terms of moving, uh, making their way from generalized to specialized capabilities. Now, on the generalized side, the first one is obviously the consumer. So if you look at a typical organization, many users would be using personal assistants uh, or that are based out of AI. For example, the chat GPT, perplexity.ai, pi.ai, and the lot. So they use primarily for day-to-day -day jobs, but more in the personal context. Organizations have moved to the second tier now where they're looking at AI apps for more specialized assistance. Um, GitHub uh, has released a co-pilot that necessarily helps users both in the software engineering side as well as on the business side with Microsoft 365 Copilot that helps amplify capability across their office suite of solutions. This includes Teams, PowerPoint, and the lot. There are other specialized um, AI models in this area that, that are relevant to the sales world as well as providing services which have come out from Salesforce. So we have now the consumer, uh, consumerized, personalized AI assistant, and now we have more specialized roles. Organizations are seeing a third uh, realm of uh, specialized AI capabilities also playing a role in fewer organizations, but organizations nonetheless, where they're using more specialized closed models, the ones which are not available yet for fine tuning or being able to customize it to your direct needs. OpenAI's GPT-4, Azure OpenAI APIs come to mind. They can do a wide variety of general purpose tasks um, and it's more generalized in that sense, but can, can necessarily attend to a large number of niche activities that are relevant for your industry. And then we have the fourth and the fifth, uh, which are extremely niche, which is uh, being able to customize some of these open models for your relevant use case. Now, CodeGen and StarCoder are primarily for code generation and code completion use cases. Uh, these models are very sophisticated. They have a deep understanding of over 58 languages. If you look at Bloom and Dolly, they are more in the text and image area. They're able to generate images from mere English prompts. And then you have the industry specific AI, which is Bloomberg GPT comes to mind as an example in the financial world where and they have trained uh, their models, they've created a model from scratch and trained it on all of their proprietary financial information. And they use it uh, from, uh, from a, as a general purpose transformer within, within Bloomberg. So these are some things, this is the sort of direction that we see AI being adopted in, um, in, a, in a generic sense across multiple organizations. And the key message that I'd like for all of you to take in is that, uh, AI in each of these phases are beginning to disrupt engineering, are beginning to uh, get companies to look at AI in a new light, and they are also informing some of the existing processes, as well as putting pressure on both the time and the cost to deliver new products. So that's the key message I'd like you all to take away from what AI is doing at an enterprise level. Each of these steps within engineering are going to get far more sophisticated than they are today. And this is something that's going to affect or likely come in the way of our traditional API strategy that API first companies have in today. So we've discussed what AI uh, and the trends that AI um, are, are necessarily shaping for us around the world. Now we move forward to see what it can, what it can mean for us from an API strategy point of view. So if you look at API strategy today, let me take an example of, uh, of a particular telco um, who is looking to release a capability to track orders. Um, say a customer has come in, uh, they've placed an order for a new mobile phone uh, with mobile service along with broadband and so on, right? So first thing from a strategy point of view is 
I need to have my business outcomes delivered through APIs. So the business outcome here is the consumer to be able to track their orders on their phones or on their devices and orders that they have placed that are all active. Now, for example, I've placed multiple services, like I told you, I need I need to be able to track all of them. So from a strategy, from a strategy point of view, I think about what my initiative needs to look like. What is the operating model? What are the typical metrics that I need to measure? What kind of mandate do I give the team? And when do I need to launch it? Um, so that's one part of my uh, strategy that's sort of guiding the rest of the steps. Um, I bring in the commercial team to identify any opportunity towards monetization here, potentially uh, being able to give the customer a speed test API, uh, giving additional uh, information to them through SMS so we can charge customers for that, saying that we will get an SMS as soon as your time is ready, uh, as soon as your order is ready. Um, and then um, in parallel, you also are looking at uh, engaging your API products so that you are bringing out the right information to be shared with the con consumer. And you're also going to structure it appropriately so that the consumers do not find it confusing to understand when will they get what pieces of their product suite that they've ordered and in what sequence they will get it. Um, on the on the other hand, once you have decided what you're looking for, what kind of experience you'd like to deliver through these APIs, you then engage the design team who will then work with governance, security, and developer experience to identify what is the appropriate architectural style in order to come out with this product. Um, this will also take into account the life cycle of the API, um, any details in terms of how the design needs to run, uh, what are the non-functionals that it needs to respect, both from a security standpoint as well as uh, performance in terms of how many calls it can take, uh, what sort of things that it needs to adhere to. Developer experience, on the other hand, is an important part of strategy, which keeps in track of the multiple API assets, accelerators that it has in order to get um, make sure that this de delivery happens on time and also with fewer new components as necessary. Now, when you see all of these um, strategy elements that sort of straddling them along, three key tenets are important for this strategy to work. One is to get a solid communication across these teams to make sure that these teams are communicating. They know exactly that they're chasing one common goal and that communication needs to be absolutely clear. The second part here is each of these teams or sub teams or roles need to have clarity in terms of what is expected out of them and what are the responsibilities and accountabilities they individually carry. Because if they understand that they are looking to necessarily have the overall goal of delivering the API, but at the same time, let's take the commercialization team uh, need to identify if there are genuine op monetization opportunities that come second, because they should. the idea is to get this product out and at the same time, be able to monetize all opportunities as relevant. And the third most important tenet is that each of these teams have necessary OLAs, operational level agreements, that you will that the teams will have to individually respect so that everyone has got adequate time in order to do their job the best they can. Now, when you look at the strategy as such overall, let's take the first tenet. When it comes to communication circulating around to make sure that uh, the teams know what they are supposed to do and they have the necessary assets that they need to work on, with AI coming in on the back of a corporate strategy saying that we need to bring AI into our engineering, it's important to respect the regulation. Now, regulatory scrutiny is going to be huge with AI coming in, especially ethical AI, responsible by design AI, and some of these considerations that come in along with artificial intelligence impacting engineering. It's important to make sure there's a very clear chain of command as the API asset is being built, tested, and delivered to make sure that it's absolutely clear in terms of what is the audit trail of this particular asset. Um, it's important from a regulatory standpoint that we have appropriate electronically verifiable um, uh, um, audit trail for these assets. And when you look at the API example that I told you about in terms of tracking in order, um, one would have imagined that this would be tracked by the individual who's purchased the order. But in future with AI coming in, uh, um, you would also see that APIs can be consumed by machines too, by AI bots. And uh, the rate at which you consume these machines 
and the sort of security protocol uh, that needs to be put in place if, if APIs are being consumed by a machine, much less a human, in that case, some of your uh, rules and policies would need to vary. So it needs to be, again, brought into picture from a strategic point of view that you'll need to imagine that your APIs can be consumed by not just a human, but also by a machine. And now in terms of uh, ever since COVID happened, um, much of the uh, consumers are sort of used to interacting with their systems digitally. So they're generally ordering food, pretty much everything uh, through uh, mobile or e-commerce. So they have a heightened expectations towards being able to be delighted uh, in terms of an experience standpoint. And corporations and telcos and pretty much all major uh, companies are out there are looking to make sure that customer delight is right on top of their um, of the expectation that they'd like to deliver. So therefore, being able to come out with specific add-ons. Now, for example, being able to take a, a, a make a guesstimate on when some of these products are likely to be shipped to you or uh, arrive at your doorstep is an important customer delight standpoint. Even if the the system isn't having some of those dates handy, so you'll need to make predictions. You'll need to pass this information on to, um, to the end customer. So while this could be something that from a product standpoint that could be set as an aspiration, it's important to make sure that whatever recommendations you put out on the back of AI are indeed explainable. You should be able to trace how these explanations were given out so that we can prevent um, issues such as hallucinations that these AI models are typically prone to. So largely speaking, we are uh, our API strategy needs to be um, uh, um, malleable to a point wherein it can survive regulatory scrutiny. Uh, the OLAs will have to be adjusted because of the pressure that we will have to deliver some of these things on time within budget, as well as um, um, potentially the expectation is to, to do it faster and cheaper at the same time. And also to think that these APIs can be used by machines and can be utilized in different ways than originally imagined. Some of our practices needs to be reviewed and reviewed um, over and over again periodically to make sure that uh, we are um, you know, up for this AI era. So if you were to look at some of these API strategy um, pieces that API first companies today have, what I've done is I've envis envisioned a world that will um, necessarily have corporates driving AI strategy down, um, top down, and some of the implications that the engineering teams are likely to have on the back of these trends. So on the left-hand side, I've taken uh, <laughs> six trends in total. And if you look at some of these trends, we have um, API pair, I'm sorry, AI pair programmers are now becoming mainstream. Um, so these are trends that um, are going to be influenced by our strategy. So therefore, people will get um, the second phase that I talked about uh, in my second slide, wherein people are going to get specialized uh, assistance. Um, GitHub Copilot is a good example. So necessarily, uh, teams are going to have productivity enhancing AI tools um, at their beck and call. Therefore, <clears throat> they will be necessarily generating software tests automatically with the help of these models. You also will see a lot more talent, um, especially the non-technical staff coming in to into the workforce who can design and build APIs at scale, uh, particularly shadow IT business teams who may also engage in, in um, generating some of these APIs. So the key trends here indicate that there will be a lot more development capacity and who will be reliant on AI models to be able to fast track and generate API products. So for us in the API engineering wheel, in the engineering field, we expect that we will need to strengthen API debugging and API testing to get absolutely right uh, to make sure that some of these models, whatever test cases they generate, whatever code they generate, and the fact that we are going to democratize API design and build, it's important to make sure that <laughs> we have necessarily necessary levels of scrutiny from an API engineering standpoint and to make sure that whatever um, products that are being built are of the right quality. Um, one other trend uh, like I spoke about in my previous slide is 
uh, with AI coming in, uh, this is an opportunity that organizations are are seeking to necessarily bring down cost and uh, also make sure that the API products can be delivered at speed. Now, in such a case, um, from an engineering standpoint, we will need to have um, knowledge of which are the speed, which are the aspects of our supply uh, uh, of our development chain that we can necessarily help automate and any of the repetitive activities need to be delegated to AI. So for that, the entire talent within the API engineering team must undergo a level of awareness of AI tools that are in the vicinity that can help them, that can, that can educate them on the possibility of what can be enhanced from an AI standpoint, as well as how we can streamline and deliver quality with speed. Some of these um, um, talents will be um, going to the next level wherein they can build AI modules uh, for APIs and some of them could necessarily go even further to gain mastery over the subject. But broadly speaking, our talent strategy should mirror uh, the AI uh, expectation so that we can definitely deliver this to time and to cost. Um, in terms of the next set of trends, um, I see that AI is now coming to a point wherein it can enable autonomous integrations. So there are platforms called Superface, uh, is, uh, as an example that comes to mind, that can consume standard documentation and generate code, as well as integration uh, into multiple services to deliver a freestanding API. Now, if you look at some of these things from an engineering standpoint, this sounds wow. But what, uh, why uh, we may not be able to leverage this straight away is potential for legacy. Now, several legacy components that may exist within our within our landscape may not have documentation in the Markdown format. They may not have documentation that contains details in terms of um, how these methods need to be invoked. How what are the authentication and authorization policies that need to be respected? Any versioning security policies and any error handling scenarios that needs to be factored in. Some of the documentation may not be as comprehensive. So if the implication for the API engineering teams is to uplift the documentation and make sure that we have relevant information captured in a specific format that these AI engines can necessarily process. And that will make the job for the engineering teams much easier and smoother. And another trend that's coming out again um, to my earlier point about customer delight is the emphasis on being context aware. One example that I can think of are, is that um, telcos um, um, of the modern day are, are deeply um, inclined to make sure that uh, they respect curfew hours, do not send messages to consumers uh, beyond a certain time, say after eight o'clock or after nine o'clock in the evening, so that they are not disturbed. Now, depending on where the customer is, um, let's say the customer is um, in South Australia or potentially in Western Australia, um, there is an element of time difference. So understanding the context of where the customer is, where the customer is likely to operate from, and taking that context into, uh, the, into your product set and making sure that your products are appropriate from an engineering standpoint to take into account that awareness and then uh, be able to decide whether this information or notification needs to be sent to the customer is important. So the context aware capabilities such as Google awareness is, a, is, an, is an example of that should be a part of our platform offering. So from an engineering standpoint, we need to understand what, what uh, some of these uh, APIs, external APIs can help us achieve. So being context aware and giving that customer delight is going to be absolutely key for us to be relevant uh, going forward. Um, largely, la <clears throat> lastly, again, in the interest of time, I'll just trim off with the sixth trend, is about with the large number of language models coming out and um, um, uh, the focus on delivering the minimum viable product uh, swiftly, sometimes um, <clears throat> since the focus may not be as strong when it comes to uh, secure coding and security policies governing these APIs at scale. So people might end up taking shortcuts on some of these things uh, in light of getting the functionality out for to the public uh, um, as quickly as possible and uh, plan for their market launch. So from an engineering standpoint, it's important that we have routine security code audits um, be able for both new as well as modify modification of existing API 
as part of our uh, dev, uh, uh, DevSecOps pipelines to make sure that whatever APIs that are being churned out have secure code in them and also any dependent libraries required for these APIs to function are also held securely. So this is important uh, from an engineering standpoint that we follow uh, thoroughly so that even in the event of these trends coming in and people using these products, our process and our strategy remain strong. So in terms of the final takeaways that I'd like to leave you with is that the design and architecture, regardless of how much of commoditization happens on the software engineering coding standpoint, API design and architecture will continue to be in the human domain. Um, we may have AI aided bots that will help us with the collaboration of design reviews and generate API documentation. So we need to make sure that our um, OLAs reflect that and allow for AI and embrace the possibility of what AI can do for us uh, to generate these documents. In addition to that, uh, we need to have our APIs updated uh, from a documentation policies accessibility standpoint so that we can let the are the right uh, phase to leverage AI optimally. And also we need to see that our API designs are kept up to date for it to be consumed either by humans or by machines and to look at our identity and access verification formats so that it's in sync with what the outcomes that we are looking to achieve. Lastly, from uh, on a periodic basis, we need to have governance mechanisms in place. Uh, so make sure that we are constantly reviewing some of the newer uh, elements that AI is giving us in terms of products, platforms, and services so that we continually try to uh, remain on the bleeding edge for as long as we need to in order to keep ourselves optimal, lean, and lightweight and still help unlock business outcomes and deliver rock solid results. And these are some of the thoughts I'd like to leave you with. Uh, if there are any questions, happy to take them now. Thank you very much.